small ecotourism business that I cater to certain people and and yes if there's things going wrong down there I would certainly be affected by it. And what kind of things is this ecotourism business do? Hikes and canoe kayaking overnight camping. Okay, and, uh, and specific rivers that you're using kind of Swanee, Litnikochi, Lapaha. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go ahead and look at your resume, which I have as petitioners, which is labeled as B, as in Victor, N, as in Nancy. state mine as a geologist doing you know, exploration and mining and mapping and uh, geochemistry of the ore body and uh, mines planning and mining supervision. I uh, worked for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection uh, where I was uh, going kind of, it's when the rules were first starting to come into effect uh, the, you know, the, for the water management district and DEP, so it's kind of a liaison between the two organizations, making sure everybody knew what the rules and regulations were, so to say, including health departments, cities and counties in the area, and I worked in all 14 counties at the water management district, the Swanee River Water Management District is in. Wonderful. I would now like to move this witness to Any objections to this tenure for geology? None from the department. They are. Is acceptable. Yeah. <coughs> right. uh, so earlier, I think you were standing on the hallway, so maybe you didn't hear this, but Ms. Prather actually stated that the department found that there would be no negative impacts of the pipeline project. Do you agree with that? What's That's objection that mischaracterizes the testimony. Do you believe that there would be no negative pipeline, no negative impacts of the pipeline? It's impossible to say that there won't be. Can you elaborate? Because they don't know. You know, you don't know what the effects are going to be as you excavate or drill through this karst area. Uh, lots of different things can happen, and depending upon drought conditions, rainfall conditions, weather sinkholes. 
interactive of what you charred when you were digging or drilling and, um, and most of the sinkholes that do occur in these areas are mostly man-made in, in the sense that they did something that altered the landscape or rerouted water and you know, sinkholes form. Can you turn to exhibit R? More or less an outline, you know, touch on, touching on these subjects, you know, basically so you can ask me questions about them based upon these subjects. I could sit here and uh, just go through it. Um, I did visit the site. And Before we uh, talk about the contents of the exhibit, let's deal with any objection. Is there an objection to this exhibit? Yes, sir. Uh, we have a number of objections. Hearsay, authentication. There's one, two, three, four maps with some data purportedly to be depicted on it, and we have different concerns with each of them. My initial concern with the cover page is that it's an outline of testimony, so I don't think that's uh, particularly relevant unless the read off his, his notes. It's just like a so it looks like a table of contents on this. Uh, Ms. Moon, lay a foundation for uh, Dolphins to see these things. All right. So if you, the first page there, who wrote that page the little outline that you have? I did. All right. Um, and then the second page, the second who, page. Who made this map? I made it. Okay. And third page, <laughs> who made that map? I made that one. Okay, and any kind of software that you use to make that? Uh, yeah, I use uh, ArcView, different layers that I received from the Swanee River District on DEP. Okay, four page. There's not, it's not just a map, it's not just a cutaway, there's data superimposed over it, but there's no indication as to the data source or how it got on there or to the, how he obtained it or how he uh, delineated it on the, struct, on the map. I will address that with each map individually. That's what I do, and then we can edit them one by one. If you want to go through them as, in yeah. terms of proffering on the basis of the data. Sure. Because well, I don't know if it's going to go the truth of the matter, sir. For instance, sir, there's a, Your Honor, it indicates he, he has a, a marking on the first map that says sinkhole feature, and then there are two red lines that that point to, to 
a, a different coloration on it, but there's no indication as to what data source was used in order to make that determination. So it's going to be offered for the truth of the matter asserted. The information overlaid on the matter I have concerns about it in terms of foundation. All right. Uh, Ms. Bean, let's go through these documents. All right. We'll see if there's a problem. All right. Does um, the first map speak to a particular issue on your outline? That's a close-up view uh, using LIDAR. Uh, as a means of locating detailed, small sinkhole impressions uh, in, in smaller areas. So, and, and what I've done with it, I, I went out there and visited the site. Uh, we GPS certain sinkholes out there. I used I GPS the, uh, the line, the, the stakes going through the woods, so I could draw that white line and follow those stakes. I then, as simply as most other geologists would do, I did a lineation based upon the sinkhole lineups on the, on the map. Uh, and actually, one of them, when you look at the uh, Greg Jones's maps or some of the other sinkhole maps, they do line up with one, you know, with one of the lineations, specifically the one that's going northeast, southwest on there. The river is just out of the picture. Uh, and this particular section, is where it first dropped the orange is a higher elevation and you know and your point of where you're going to be I guess doing the starting the drilling is probably just off the map maybe in that pasture but uh, so I just kind of walked through it GPSed it put them on a map and looked at some of the sinkholes took some pictures and and really identifying the sinkhole features point at two of them, but the bottom line is every blue mark on there is some sort of a depressional feature in that karst mask. And where did you get the LIDAR data from? Uh, Swanee River Water Management District. And also, and then, and then the sinkhole data? I took a picture of the sinkhole and then the sinkhole data? The sinkhole data is just based upon LIDAR elevations and my visiting the site and looking at <coughs> these depressions. Okay, so the sinkhole marks are from your Yes, and that's just some of them. Okay. You know, that's just, you know, I've been pointless to go out there and map them all. Now that we've laid the foundation, what does this show? Well, specifically, what's going on and why I did this one. Fracture traces are just exactly what they say. You have the Ocala uplift, it split the earth when it raised up the rock, split it in preferred directions. Northeast, southwest, northwest, southeast, and you can pick these out by sinkhole lineations. You can see them if they follow certain directions. So in this particular area, I you know went there and looked. I could see the sloughs. Some of these are just actually sloughs with deeper areas in them as you walk along them and line them up. And where most big major sinkholes occur. You know, in this area uh, is where lineations cross. Getting, you know, this cracking going on in several different directions, but they cross, and you know, the whole area is affected by it. The reason, you know, these limestones that we are looking at underneath the surface are very old, obviously, and they were exposed at different times without any of this sand and clays. So they, through the eons, they accumulated, you know, more cracks and fissures and cavities due to solution. In the historical past, but not the, you know, not ancient, you know, the uh, sea levels were 300 feet lower. And so you can be sure, because I've drilled in them, that some of these sinkholes in these areas are 300 feet deep, or the effects of them, they filled in and you can drill through them and see the sediments. There's no limestone. I've done that several times around some of the big lakes that are sinkhole lakes. Uh, so that's what I'm saying here. I'm saying that this is created by karst activity. The karst activity is ongoing. Uh, there's photographs in there that you know, we took on the day that we went out there showing active sinkholes right along the lineation of their, uh, of their pipeline route. 
they're easy to identify, especially if they're active. There was actually a couple where you, know, you have water seeping and flowing and then going down in the ground right nearby. Um, you know, it's a trickle, but that's what it is. It's you know, just found its way into the aquifer. And then the white line again, what is that? The white line is the route across the property. And I, and I do apologize. I understand them. I'm better than this other than the fact that you know, this is all coming out very quickly. I can explain everything I've got on the map. But, uh, you know, where, where are we on this map? You look at the next page, and you see it's uh, kind of an off-colored map, road map. And I have the, uh, that white line is on here. And that northwest side of that, especially with those groupings of uh, three or four red, I mean, green dots are, that's the extent of it. I just didn't feel like I needed to go through the whole thing. I, I picked that particular area because of that particular feature, but those features are scattered throughout this area. And what are those particular features again? Those fracture traces that cross, plus you can see the depressional nature um, there. Okay. Um, Based upon the blue versus the you know, blue being the lowest point, the elevation, brownish red being the highest point. And then on that second map, page number three, um, that was the larger scale. Right, I basically did that to show where we're at in the area. Great. And then moving on to the fourth map, uh, what are you depicting here? This is a obviously a, a smaller scale, but a larger view of the area showing the confluence of the width of the Gucci and, and the Swanee. The Swanee is what's coming in from the northeast to the southwest. The width of the is the other line on there. I located my uh, my white line on there based upon my uh, you know, GPS coordinates. And I and I really looked at the maps that are produced by Sable Trail to make sure that I wasn't mistaken in the area of where I put them at. So what you're looking at is a, a karst area that has been affected by stream erosion, vertical subsidence, and these rivers probably at some time or another have meandered across them. Uh, and out west it would be a meander plain, but here in the south we very seldom have meander plains. So, but essentially, that's the one interpretation is that's where the river has went back and forth through the ages as it's eroded the banks and went this way and eroded back in the other direction. And, and that's one of the, truthfully what it happens is it's showing the removal. That orange is a protective clay. And the higher you get in elevation, the more clay you got between that and the limestone. So the river coming through here has kind of eroded the elevation down closer to the rock. And that in turn is, you know, helps create these sinkhole conditions in this karst activity. Obviously the river is a low pH, limestone, again limestone, calcium carbonate, you know, there's a lot of you know, dissolution going on and specifically under those this river. Um, there are high water conditions. The aquifers got tannin water in it, and people's wells are there has to have tannin water in it, you know, way away from the river. And during dry conditions like right now, or drier conditions like we have right now, the river is actually acting like a spring. It's, the river is cut into the Florida and aquifer all the way from White Springs, which probably is 80 miles upstream. And so you got a combination of aquifer water coming in and you know river water from the Okefenokee and the other swamps north of White Springs coming in. So, so you really are draining the aquifer, the river itself is draining the aquifer in this particular area. And as far as water flow in this area, you were talking about that already. Is there any unique features about the water flow in this area? Unique features about water flow, if you mm -hmm. were to speak huh. of uh, Palma Spring, something like that is what you're talking about? Sure. Well, Palma is just off this map. 
and and the cave system goes up to the river. You can see that, that line right there. And I guess what, when you have these fracture traces, those fractures are not created by the dissolution of the limestone. They go to death. What's, what has happened with the dissolution of the limestone is that they've expanded, they've created, you know, they've allowed the water, to, that tannin water to get down into the aquifer. They go preferential directions depending upon, you know, different layers of limestone so they can erode differently. So you get a, you got a fracture that water comes in and differential the solution goes on. You got a cave system forming that may or may not necessarily follow the fracture trace, but now it can follow softer limestone traces, you know, through the, through the rock. So it expands, gets bigger, and, and a lot of the cave maps show that. Okay. And the final map, I believe, Number five. Can you talk to us about that one? It was just, you know, showing the force of nature of, of the land is going through. You know, obviously the reason the pasture quits where it does is because the rest of it drops down to this very unstable environment. Uh, I was a well driller for nine years, and I drilled in these environments. And, so I have, I know how unstable they are. And so you say you have experience with wells. Um, what has your, been your experience with wells and, and the karst um, geology such as this one? I would say experience with drilling and wells. I drilled, and, well, I was a geologist out in the field with the drill rigs. I had four drill rigs and four hand crews at one time, five drill rigs, and you know, drilling. And uh, it wasn't in this environment, but you know, you're encountering these paleo sinkholes and mapping them, and you get a good feel for Know, where the phosphate deposits at and you know, that kind of thing. I, I went to work for the water management district and I was eventually, after DDP, I went to work for the water management district. I was a water use permitter. I dealt with all the water well contractors, listened to their problems. Um, went out in the field a lot, had a lot of sinkhole patrol. Whenever there was a sinkhole occurring anywhere in the district, I went out and looked at it, tried to advise you know, the residents, you know, the danger or not danger, what they could do. I, uh, when I quit the water management district, I went into well drilling and I bought a couple of rigs and I drilled all the year doing residential and some public supply wells. I built the two public supply wells for uh, the town of Lee, which is just across the river in, 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 the, in this environment. And I drilled a lot of wells, or several. I did the monitor well plan for the, for the well, it used to be Gold Kiss, now it's the Pilgrim's Pride, the chicken plant down there. Done a lot of work on their wells, cleaning them, repairing them. You know, they, you know, one of the big problems with water wells is water table fluctuations in the aquifer. And when water levels drop, you, you got rattling of sands. And so, a lot of these wells, when people are pumping sand, a lot of times it's because you've had heavy rainfall during drought conditions and sand just kind of moving down and falling into your well. Uh, so that's what was going on at Goldfish. So I had to uh, clean those out, re-plug them, re grout them, uh, and then drill the monitor wells, just, you know, just obviously to see where their um, contamination flows were going. Uh, I also did a little bit of sinkhole investigation for them out there because they were excavating stormwater ponds or doing something, some kind of a pond, and that started falling in. Uh, I had experience not too far away with that sawmill. And, and their sinkhole problems. You know, I went out there and did their sinkhole investigation and told them not to move the clay off. That's what was keeping it from falling in. And the first thing they do is dig stormwater ponds and move the clay off. And then they had all these sinkhole problems. And really what this, I guess the drilling, what, what happened, and I'm saying this because when they're cleaning these, when they're cleaning these stormwater ponds out, and this is the environment you're going to be drilling in. This limestone is dissolved. The softer stuff is gone. The harder stuff is still there. A lot of that hard limestone, the Swanee limestone, is very hard. And originally, it was the aggregate, but the only aggregate source in Florida, except the Avon Park, which had a lower elevation. And it, it's kind of sporadic. But not only was it very hard, it also had a lot of silicification, so you got big chirp boulders. So 
any of these excavations that I'm talking about, they have gone down and dug, and then they pull it out these boulders, and they're pushing dirt back in. So there's there's large stones sitting being suspended in this sediment all through this area. I mean, that's basically the whole thing is just moved and shifted, and whatever limestone wanted to dissolve, dissolved. Whatever hard rock didn't just got stuck in that suspension of the sands and clays and and during my drilling years, so obviously you're. I'm sorry, but somewhere in here I'd like to hear a question. This has just become a narrative. Well, it is a narrative. No, it's, uh, with no uh, questions from council. Um, specifically with the pipeline coming through this area, what specific concerns do you have? Specifically, removing clay in this karst area is the most significant thing about causing sinkholes water ponds and drilling horizontally. I, mean, I will admit I have no experience drilling horizontally. I can tell you it's got to be a million times harder than drilling vertically. And drilling so vertically in these vertically. areas are is difficult because of the movement and shifting of the rocks, get your bent stuck. And, and people who and water well drillers have obviously have hammers and pound their casing through. So I, I just, you know, so, so this thing is going to be going horizontally in this sphere of influence of karst activity with and, and pumping fluids and you're drilling fluids in there. It's going to be washing your clays away and you're washing your sands away. They're going to get into the cavities, like a plug cavities. You know, and things, well, I, I can tell you what else might happen. As you finish up and you're dragging that, that casing back through, rocks are going to shift and you're going to be stuck on those rocks. It happens. All the time, and it's not even a once in a while thing. It's a very, very common thing. Get your bit stuck and your case is stuck trying to withdraw. And you're doing this in this particular area where things are mobile to begin with. And something may not happen right now, but sooner or later something will happen. It, it, you can't help it. It's impossible that along this route you're not going to be encountering problem with that karst activity. And to me, look at the map on the other side, the entire pipeline route is conveniently located in the karst area of Florida. Uh, if you look at all the drastic maps, which are maps produced by the Water Manager District showing where we're most susceptible to groundwater contamination, this is, they take the route right through it, uh, all the way down south. Thank you. Is there anything else about these maps that you'd like to well, you know, I, there's some photos here, and you know, I just. You know. um, he's talking about the photos in Exhibit S, as in Sam. Um, well, oh, that's right. They did come in the same. Okay. All right. Do you want to move seven? I would. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm overruling the objections and admitting Exhibit Seven, Petition Seven. And I'm, and I'm just going to point to yeah, two of these. Both of them are talking about now. We're in exhibit S. Don't get ahead of us. Okay. All right, I'm marking this exhibit. Petitions. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the, the flood plain that this pipeline is going across. This is number one. Uh, I'm looking at the. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking at the first one. I'm looking at the third one. Okay, page three. Objection oh, authentication. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Who took this picture? I think Mr. Uh, Chris did. And were you present? I was present. Okay, thank you. Please tell us where it's located. Well, let me rephrase it. Okay. I was present when a lot of these were taken. <laughs> Chris went back and took some more. I do not know if this was taken, but I saw these features when I was out there. So, and I, so and I know he went back out there before. specifically looking for these features that are right on the pipeline ground. Okay. So what we have here, I'm just looking at the third picture in, is Miss Merkel standing. I mean, I just, objection. What do you mean see these features? What I see is a bunch of trees. Well, that's, why I'm looking at the third, that's why I'm looking at the third photo. That's for cross. And then proceed, Mr. Okay. 
Yeah. Because the feature in there is is Miss Merkel's head, you know, because she's standing in one of those sinkholes that are active out on that property. It Which just really. Is this again? Hmm? Which property is this? This is the pipeline route on that white pipeline route okay. that I have on the. On, so this on is the map. pipeline route that you depict on the maps. Right. In the previous exhibit. Right. Okay. And in the photo after that of Miss Merkel. Standing in another active sinkhole that's this going is on. Page four. It would be S four. Yeah. Okay. I guess I don't know. It's a compound exhibit, so I guess each time I guess asked was he present at the time the photograph was taken? I was present at the time this one was taken. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I mean the point of these is I mean it's very short. There's active sinkholes occurring in the pipeline. Along that pipeline route in the state park area where this drill line, this drill route is going through, the pipeline route is going. Okay. I believe you spoke to pages three and four. Pardon? You spoke to pages three and four. I'd like to move this. I need a verbal answer. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. okay. So you want the figure say to be the uh, pages three and four? All right. Is that. Uh, Amendment. Good area to be doing that kind of excavation and drilling. I think sinkhole prone and with, uh, additional factors of all the irrigation systems in the area. We're going to have artificial drawdowns during droughts and big rainfall events and uh, whatever disturbance we've created someplace along the way, those are going to shift and move and, and we're going to have problems. It's just not stable. Turn back to your first figure in exhibit seven, the blow up lidar. The, the white diagonal line you said indicates the uh, proposed pipeline route, is that correct? Yes. And you said you based that off. Uh, going to stakes that you saw out of the ground? Yes. How do you know those were sable trail stakes? I went out there with uh, Chris Merkel and, and the stakes on there were identified, they were written on, center line, <coughs> SD or something was written on them that identified them. Then I went back and looked at the routes that you all had in your, your submittals. You could see, you know, I can pick features out that you make sure I was in the right area. And I knew I was in the right area because I could see the, the line, you know, the, the stakes, the conservators put in there, but also based upon your own submittals, I could tell it was in the right area. How many stakes did you see? Uh, Some more down, 10 or 15. And that line wasn't based on, uh, and you mentioned ArcView earlier, so you know what a shapefile is? And can you just briefly explain what a shapefile is? Shapefile is a representation in the computer of an area given a 3D dimensional plus location. So a shape file gives you, I mean, if you, you can import like a, if you have a map sitting here, an art view map, and there's nothing on it, and you want to uh, import topography from the USGS, and, and they have that as a shape file. And you knew that this was the city of Live Oak, and you imported, you know, that 
topographic map and overlay it, it would still be the city of Live Oak sitting right where your finger's at. So basically it's three-dimensional and locational by you know, coordinates. And you didn't use a shape file of the route to plot the route on this figure, correct? I did not. Oh, and no. you didn't use uh, computer analysis to compare your estimate of the route with an actual survey route, correct? Right. So it's fair to say that's an estimate of the proposed route location? Within 25 or 30 feet. 25 or 30 feet? The green dots that indicate, I guess you say indicate located sinkholes, are those ones you located that day that you did the survey? And, when, and let's just be clear, was it one day of surveying that you did? I walked in the woods and we did uh, GPS locations of these and, and then I took those GPS locations of you know, lap longs and, and put them into our view and my map. What equipment did you use for GPSing? Uh, it was a, 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 a camera app. Did you use, use an iPhone? The answer would be yes. Okay. And what is the accuracy of an iPhone GPS? Imagine 25, 35 feet. I mean, they're pretty sophisticated these days, plus they've got more satellites up there than ever. So. <laughs> the black lines you marked as fractured traces, um, are those approximations that you provided on this map? Well, I don't know that you could dig down in the ground and encounter that particular fracture right underneath that black mark, but you know there's width and there's width to them, and you know the effects at the surface might be slightly at an angle to them in that respect. But if you were to go through that area, you're going you know dig through the limestone, you're going to encounter them somewhere. You drew these lines based on your photo interpretation of the lidar data, correct? Right not GPSing points when you're out in the field, correct? Uh, right. But actually some of the points you know, that, I, that I did see specifically, there's three that are in that big blue area right where the two. You know, I, I made this map afterwards. But that was a particularly larger depressional area with several depressions inside of it, which is made me suspicious. So when I went back and looked, that's, I specifically picked that area because it doesn't look good. And you also mark on there, uh, in the darker blue areas, uh, at least two blue areas, you say sinkhole features. All right. But, I, 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 I've got to copy and paste it down all over the map, you know, from what I saw in there. I just, it was pointless to do them all. But you don't have a green dot that says located sinkhole. Correct. So you didn't find a sinkhole in that sinkhole feature, in the two sinkhole features that are marked? I would say that they were a little bit too far away from the, the line we were walking, and I just walked over and looked at them. Um, some were you know, small ponds. Um, they, they fall into these, you know, these, uh, these blue lineations, and, and like anything else, you can call them sloughs that are out there. But, so just because it's dark blue doesn't mean it's a sinkhole feature. It could be anything. It's just an, an indication of depressional area, correct? I would more characterize it as anything blue on there. You'd have to show me that it's not a sinkhole feature, a depressional feature that's not related to some karst activity. Then for me to just automatically you know, say, yeah, they're 50-50, who knows, you know, you know, my gut feeling is from walking out there and looking at them, but it's riddled with these features, which is why I didn't pick out the first two photos to look at when we were looking at these photos, because they're featureless almost, even though we know that that's a depression. So the blue area is these lowest points in there you think are potentially single features. Yes, I do. Looking behind you, uh, the petitioner's map, which hasn't been pre-marked or identified, um, is your inset area depicted on this map? Mm -hmm. And could you just point that out to the judge? Right in here. Okay. So, this is how the record 
show that uh, the wind has pointed out an area to the northwest quadrant of the map on the west side of the Suwannee River within the floodplain area. Would you agree with this? A fair, I did a fair description of where you pointed to. And I see a bunch of blue uh, oxbow type structures and, and whatnot. And are those those abandoned meanders that you were speaking about earlier? They are sloughs, abandoned meanders, if that's what they are, but they're probably related to the river having traversed over them, eroded them, some erosion. Uh, but that's the reason I went for a close up and I got rid of. If you were to. This, this is one set of elevation. One set of. You know, when you're looking at this, all you see is this feature, these blue features. If you were to do what I did, all these other little features will pop out because now you're looking at elevation changes from, you know, maybe 140 to 130. Whereas here you're looking at elevation changes from. Maybe 100, you know, 1500. You know, so I don't know what these higher elevations are, but the color scheme changes, and you can't see the more finer details that are in that particular area. So that's why I did this, as opposed to why I you know, other one on here. I wanted to. Could, could you point out the uh, abandoned meanders in your uh, zoomed in one, which is the uh, uh, first abandoned speaker? meander? I would first off these depressions have to occur. And then the river has to flood through them. And so if you've got a depression, the river's going to be flooding through them. So they're kind of a combination of both things. You know, they're, they're depressional features because of the karst activity. The rivers come in, it moves sand and dirt around, but it still, you know, still hasn't hidden these features. And that would be the clue to this whole thing. It hasn't hidden them by all the years of stuff washing in and moving around. They're active, you know, and, and and the energy is so low in there anyway. You know, if you when the river floods, all that energy is in the river, middle of the river. There's no depositional sandbars out here that you would expect. If, you know, if, it, if the river's in, in it's going down the river and you're inside the banks, they are in flooding conditions. Got a lot of turbulence. It carries all the sand. That's why you see the sandbars on the other picture on the other side, all up and down the river. Cut banks and slip banks. But as soon as it tops the bank, that energy dissipates, and now you're in just a flood area. And there's hardly any energy carrying anything. So that's I, you know, I, that's why you're not going to find little sand deposits and sand dunes all through that area. You're just you're, you're in a swamp, so to say. If you were to walk up to it from that high area, they're in flood conditions. It's basically still. You'd have to be very discern, it'd be hard to discern, you know, movement. You have to watch a leaf in there to actually see a current. And that's, you know, the FEMA maps operate like that. That's what the Army Corps does. It, you, know, you can actually tell what the current is by turning on some of the Army Corps features in your FEMA maps to, you know, to get flow velocity. Uh, so there's no velocity. So this, you know, some of these things have got to be ancient. Some of them are just, you know, continuing to grow. But you didn't identify any abandoned features on this blow as abandoned meander. I don't, yeah. you know, no, because number one, I'm not saying they're not there. I mean, this is a floodplain, and you got you know thousands of years of activity of caused this out. So I'm saying, that on top of the, these meander features that I do believe are out there. You see these depressional things forming that continue to lower the land surface out there actively. And let's keep talking a little bit about the investigation you did uh, that one day. You didn't do any geotechnical data collection, correct? No, but I looked at your split spoon borings that you did. You had a cross section through that area that you did. Or three split spoons on that side of the river and one on the other side. And you didn't do your own geophysical investigation, correct? I didn't need to. I used all your data. I liked it. And you didn't do any borings yourself? No. And what's the depth of the pipe, uh, to your knowledge, at the location of your inset area? Uh, I think it's 65 feet below the point where you're going in the ground, or 60 feet. I think that's what the cross section I looked at said. Went down. So the river itself bottom of the river, I don't who knows, but the river 
the other day was, or right now, as a matter of fact, the river level was, I can tell you. The reason I looked at that was because I was interested to see how far the borehole was actually below the bed of the river. <coughs> So, and I think there's about okay. River level right now, today, the check the water management district site is 30.49 feet at the point that they did their measurement today. The elevation up here, I think, was 141 or something like that. When you say up here, up, where do you I'm mean? Sorry. Where you're, on, where you start to descend off the uplands, as you would have to say that they are here, because there's a slope going down into the green area. See, that's that's what I'm saying. My it doesn't show up up here, but there's a higher elevation right here. So, but on your figure, you're referring to that's the about area where you're going into the ground. And I think your elevations are about 141 feet. River levels right now is at 30.9 feet, 49 feet. And if it was 10 feet deep. The bottom of the river is at 20, and 60, say 60 from 140 is 80, would be, and so, so 80 feet, how would you do that, so 65 feet deep, that, so it's only about 30 feet underneath the river. The river's not depicted on your inside, that's correct? No, it's right here. But it is you can pick it on this next one over and I would like to add that that map in our exhibits is exhibit that he's referring to exhibit B is in Victor, page eleven. And I would like to use any evidence that you guys have about it. Simply maybe using it for demonstrative purposes. Up to something with that question about how deep you were going. I was. Given that you didn't do geophysical or geotechnical uh, research when you drew these fractured traces, you don't know with how far these fractured traces extend below the surface, correct? The, the fractured traces are original cracking of the limestone from the Ocala uplift. And you don't know how far the cracking of the limestone extends below where you've indicated these fractures are. Well, of course I don't know specifically. Like, you know, you think that could be. Well, that's the process right there. So we yeah. have the elevation I'd like to show you, I'm going to show the witness what's already been entered into exhibit, uh, into evidence that Sable Trails Exhibit 42. Focus in I'm not sure. And for ease of reference, there's a binder that's labeled the Judas. And it has a tab for three. You said you recognize that cross section? Let's wait a second. I believe, I believe this is the one I was looking at. I was just looking at it. It looks exactly the same. We'll give you, give you counsel one second here. What's the tab number? Uh, 42. Yeah, 42. Your Honor, it'd be one of the skinny ones. You've already said you 
you know what that is, but just so the record's clear, that's the uh, cross section of the HDD crossing of the Suwannee River. Yes. And you've seen these types of cross sections before, right? Or have you ever I've seen, seen cross, cross sections before? Yeah, many, many times. But not necessarily an HDD cross section. Not necessarily. There can't be any difference. It's simply drill holes, and you've represented the geology down to a certain depth, and then you drew a line in for the basically the where the pipe's going, but that's and you, you geologically the pipe doesn't mean anything, it's the waterfall itself. Understood. That's why I make sure the rig is good that you understand what you're looking at when you're, when you're looking at this cross section. And you can see where the line where the proposed pipeline is depicted in the cross section, correct? Right. And you can see where that line is crossing underneath the Swanee River, correct? Right. And on that depiction, what is the depth from the line to the bottom to the the bed and bank of the river? It says 42 feet. So what you bottom. And the depth of the pipeline at the location. Well, let me strike that. Using that cross section, do you have an idea of where your survey uh, points were for the sinkholes in the close-up of figure one. Do you, can you tell where that is on the profile? Yeah, but I had the advantage of having this on the computer where I could blow it up and read them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're starting from the left-hand side of this cross-section and going, basically if you're going south uh, or if you're going east, we're at first depth where it says 60, 66 feet, I think is what it says. Is that what it says? What does that mean? Yeah. I think it says uh, that, that number right there says 65 feet. All right. So, yes, that's kind of where I had that information from. And you've been out to this this area once to do your investigation, correct? Yes. How do you know? And you've made several references that these are active sinkhole features. You've only been out there one time. Did you see movement during that one time? There's specific signs you look for when you're looking at sinkhole to tell whether they're active or inactive. And, and they're very distinctive features. And one of them is that, is that you know, sediment that's exposed along the sides of the sinkhole and there's no vegetation growing on it. That is, you know, unstable area. Nothing can grow on it. It actually indicates recent movement because I mean, we're coming out of summer and there wasn't any vegetation on it, so nothing was growing on it. Another indication of active sinkholes is dead trees. You know, as, as that depression starts moving, unraveling around the roots, trees die. The roots die, sinkholes open up further because the roots are somewhat holding things together. So I can tell you that that's an active sinkhole just based on the physical appearance of it. You mentioned that you've been in the business of drilling wells in the area. Yes. Have you successfully drilled wells before? I have only had to give up once, but I've had to move over many times to put my well in. I mean, sometimes in these environments, I drill four holes before I get down and get, get out of that <coughs> loose sand. How many successful wells have you drilled? I don't know, a couple hundred. You mentioned in your direct examination about tannin water getting into the aquifer. What is tannin water? <laughs> well, it's, a, it's, a black, it's a black color in the, the river's a black water. Well, it's black because well, tannic acid. Just to be acid clear, when you say river, you mean the Swanee River? Let's say the Swanee River. We're talking about the Swanee. So, Stream from White Springs, and specifically, the river is black. When you're looking at it, well, look at that, it's black. It's what? like a mirror. That's, you mean the water is black? Yes, the water is, and if you pick it up and held it in the glass, it looks like tea. But at depth, it looks black. It reflects everything like a mirror. The, water, the source of that water is coming out of this Oki Finoki, all the swamps that drain into it, and, and all that tea colored water is tannic water. It's, been steeping in the swamps and, and uh, leaks out when it rains, it kind of flushes out into the river, and that's the source of the water into the river above White Springs. And that tannic water is a low pH. It's the 
city. Around three, three and a half, four. And through that tank water invading the aquifer, it you know obviously helps dissolve the calcium carbonate. It's not neutral. Is the water tannic at the proposed crossing of the Swanee River? It is during flood conditions, specifically. And that's where you're going to find most of your invasion. Recharge happens during the wintertime or during flood conditions. When did you become a member of WALS? Before I knew I was getting involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> I I wanted to. You still want to be a member? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because I haven't you know, explored Georgia yet on the <laughs> The community, that's why I joined. I wanted to go up into Georgia and look at some of the rivers. So. Do you remember when about you became a member? I haven't got a renewal certificate, certificate yet. So I would say I close to a year, but I'm so, not sure. Is your membership good for a year? I assume so. I just sent a check $250 in. When did you send a check in? Mm -hmm. Over a year ago. Over a year ago. So, you, so you don't know whether you're a member right now. You're an active member right now. You may or may not tell me. Tell me I'm not. I'm an actor. <laughs> I know the answer to that question. In terms of, I just want to go back to the iPhone GPS. Is it your understanding that the the quality uh, of the GPS in the iPhone is dependent upon the distance you are from a cell tower? No. Well, does your cell phone talk to with satellites or does it talk to a tower? The GPS talks to satellites. And I get, I, I'm not savvy enough to know, but I assume that my telephone talks to towers. The towers don't deliver GPS, it's satellites as far as I know. Is it your understanding that I-10 is the highway, interstate highway, I-10 is also located through area. Mm -hmm. so, yes. So, yes. yes. And are you, and you're aware that there are other pipelines that go through this area, correct? Truthfully, I wasn't, but I am now, yeah. <coughs> okay, I have no further questions. Mr. Barber, should Yes, Your Honor. Can we take a uh, brief recess for the NRA? How much time do you have? Five minutes. All right. Five minutes, right?